Good afternoon. Welcome to Future Tense. God, we got a full house today. So glad this has been sold out for two weeks. What a hot ticket! If you if you got your if you got your purse on the uh, on the chair next to you, uh, clear it off because I think we're going to be uh, we're we're going to be standing room only. Um. So yes, Future Tense is the Citizens' Guide to the Future. It's a partnership among. Uh, the New America Foundation, Arizona State University, and the online magazine Slate. And I will be one of your t two uh, cruise directors today. I'm Joel Garrow. I'm a fellow here at New America, and I'm also in the College of Law at Arizona State. And I'm a co-director of this operation. And Tori Bosch, will be, who is here somewhere, is, there she is, is the um, editor of the Future Tense channel on Slate that hit a new mark last month with five million hits in one month, and we're very proud of her. Um, let me explain what we're doing today. This is about the coin of the realm. So this is not an event about Bitcoin per se, right? Bitcoin is just the first of, these, of this species. Uh, if it disappeared tomorrow, I don't think many of us would be tremendously surprised but we suspect that it might be replaced by something else that might be adapted. Anybody here remember Alta Vista, the first search engine of any? Okay, Bitcoin might be Alta Vista, but that's okay because uh, Google might be in, in the wings. And so that's what, why we think it's important to be here today to, fi to find out what does this mean to the future of sovereign, of sovereign countries and, and their currencies. Um, a little housekeeping. Uh, this is being live streamed, and as you can see, we've got video cameras here, so all of this is on the record. Um, when it comes to Q&A, if you are uh, chosen to uh, share your wisdom, please wait for the microphone, because again, everything's being live streamed. Um, when it comes to your turn to talk, please remember to tell us who you are. And if you insist on tweeting, I have been informed that the hashtag is cryptocurrency, and actually we do encourage you to do that. Thank you very much. Um, let me introduce now uh, Simon Johnson. Um, Simon is going to explain it to us like we're five, what this is all about. Simon is a professor of entrepreneurship at the MIT Sloan School of Management. He is also a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and a member of the Congressional Budget Office's Panel of Economic Advisors. He was the International Monetary Fund's chief economist and director of its research department. Simon, like I'm five. It's all yours. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, th thanks very much for that introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. And thanks for holding the event, uh, Joel. I think this is the very good timing and exactly the right place to have an event on, on cryptocurrencies. And as you said, I think that the picture we should be looking at is exactly the broad set of cryptocurrencies. And obviously, there's going to be plenty of opportunity this afternoon to drill down into some of the specifics of Bitcoin it itself. But my main point to you in the 12 minutes or so that I have is that money is always and everywhere mostly about politics. And, and cryptocurrencies are absolutely about what, how they're viewed in Washington and other capitals around the world, and how governments approach and think about cryptocurrencies is going to have a huge effect on precisely where this leads us and, and what is the economic and, and financial impact. And to try and get that point across and to try and explain more about why cryptocurrencies, I think, are, are so important for thinking about the future, let me talk about the past. Let me talk about the history of money. and Let me break it into, into three pieces. I want to talk about silver in the 1690s. I want to talk about gold in 1896, and I want to talk about M-Pesa, which is a money transfer system that's developed in Kenya over the past 10 years. So first of all, uh, silver in, in the 1690s. If, you, if I really had time, if I had 14 minutes, I'd go back to the 700s and really you know, get you warmed up on that. But let me cut, start the story in the 1690s. In the 1690s, the, the British, or the, the English, if you prefer, at that time, have a very problematic currency with an enormous amount of counterfeiting. It's silver. It's primarily silver in circulation, but everybody is shaving a bit off the silver, taking a bit off the edges. This is a completely unsatisfactory system, and the government's having to go from time to time also. Mostly it's about private counterfeiting. 
The government at that time, the official consensus is they need to do a recoinage. What's a recoinage? You pull in all the silver and you remint it. You make the coins again using the latest scientific processes, which are completely secret at the time, state secrets. You put a milled edge on the coin and you tell people how much silver is in that coin and you put it back out into circulation. And this works. In fact, the man you put in charge of chasing down the counterfeiters and executing them is Sir Isaac Newton, the physicist. A very methodical guy. And I can tell you, if he was attorney general today, we would not be having some of our problems in this country. <laughs> but what is this about? It's about silver, silver coinage, this Western tradition on which our entire monetary system has evolved. It's about a relationship between the government and the private sector. You bring your silver to the mint if you want to, if you like the price. And they will turn that silver into coin, or they'll give you the coin equivalent of that weight of silver. It's the private sector. If the private sector decides to hell with it, I'm taking my silver to France, which is what they did, actually, because they didn't like the price set by the, the British Mint subsequently. The silver goes. You're out. The silver leaves the country. The private sector is making these key decisions about, in this case, the amount of money in the economy, which has a big knock-on effect. But it's the interaction between the private sector and the government sector that's giving you money, that constitutes money, even in this pretty basic form. So you say, well, OK, I understand that, Simon. The government's been involved in this. This has you know, been a, a long history. And we've been up and down in, in various dimensions of th this relationship. Why can't the government just back off now? Why not let us have a system which is the proposal from cryptocurrency, purely private? This is going back to a much a reference point, slightly idealized perhaps, but go back to a much earlier system. There is no government. We're anarchic. We're going to run this through our decentralized computer systems. No one can, arguably, we'll, we'll talk about the details, no one can issue counterfeits. No one can debase it. That's, that's the premise. It's a physical fixed amount, or a virtual fixed amount in this case. What's, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is, Partly that money is about sovereign authority and government, governments have been built on developing that power and that power to determine what's legal tender and what's not legal tender, what you can use to settle all debts, public and private. But it's also specifically absolutely about credit. Now, there's an interesting uh, debate about also going back to the Glorious Revolution uh, in Britain in 1688, w when exactly did the British state develop the ability to issue a lot of debt and to finance that debt through the private sector, through people voluntarily holding that debt at reasonable rates of interest? Some people say it was earlier, some people say it was later. I don't think that matters very much for this discussion. The important point is, by the mid-18th century, the British had established, and the Americans learned this lesson very well, this is absolutely Alexander Hamilton's key insight after the revolution, that you can fund the government, certainly in times of national emergency, certainly in times of war. You can fund it by issuing a lot of debt, paying down that debt in peacetime, and the fundamental cornerstone, basis of that credit system is your money. And this leads us to gold, of course, because the U.S., while well, the U.S. had a bimetallic system, silver and gold, early in the Republic, by the late 19th century, it had shifted, for various reasons, onto an, an entirely gold standard and then the election. You, you think yeah, we have arguments about politics of money and central bank policy in the United States today, and we, and we do. We, we, we worry about what Janet Yellen is going to do on what basis. That's nothing compared to the presidential election of 1896 and, and, and 1900, where the fight was specifically directly about whether you should reintroduce silver to expand the money supply and ex expand credit. That was William Jennings Bryant's claim to fame. That was the cross of gold speech of the Democratic Convention. 1890, for the, ahead of the 1896 election. Expand the money, provide more credit to the system. Fighting about who gets credit, the allocation of credit, is absolutely central to the political process and central to what the government needs to think about. Now, again, the cryptocurrencies are trying to abstract from that, saying, look, we don't like the credit system. We don't like, and, and I, I'm, I'm entirely sympathetic to this view, we don't like what has happened to our very large international complex banks. We don't like what's happened to government debt and the management of government debt. We don't like the entire system of credit, perhaps, or even fractional reserve banking that has been built around the monetary system that is between money and credit, intertwined with both. Look, I, I, 
I'm second to no one in, in, in being critical of, of, our, of our current system and the power within our, our current system. But, but I am urging you to think about the, what the backlash is going to be. Because if you really could, as Joel said, either now or in the future, have a cryptocurrency, which is completely aside from the way we run credit now, you are taking an enormous instrument of power away from the government, away from the people who currently exercise it, who currently participate in that. That's, that's enormously challenging. Of course they're going to react. And, and they're going to react with some legitimate concerns, legitimate concerns about uh, who uses the money, about money laundering, about illegal transactions, as well as having their own motivation, which is maintain a current system, which is, works very well. Well, it works well, <laughs> well enough from their perspective relative to the cryptocurrency alternative. Whether it works well, again, I think we'll discuss. There's many reasons to be dissatisfied. So I, I, I guess I'm a little concerned when people say, people from, from, from the Bitcoin community, or other people, other people say, look, we're not interested in the political discussion sign. We're not interested in representation in Washington or making our arguments in other capitals. We're just, we're just out of the system. We are constructing our own viable payment system. I can pay you, you can pay me in a way that bypasses completely all the official mechanisms, all the banks, all the governments. I honestly, I mean, look back over the history for yourselves. I don't think you can do that. I think that the, the point of exchange from your virtual cryptocurrency into goods, the government is going to have a lot to say about that. They're going to have a lot to say about the taxes. They're going to have a lot to say about issues of legality and illegality. This falls entirely within what most people regard as the legitimate mandate of government in the modern society. So. Look, I'm all in favor of challenging the system. I think this is very healthy, and I think it leads on to better things. But are the cryptocurrencies going to win by just ignoring the politics and saying we set up our own system, it's perfect, we're just going to go about our business and, and ignore the politics? I don't, I don't think so. And that leads to my, my, my third and, and final point, which is about uh, M-Pesa. So M-Pesa is a money transfer system that exists in Kenya. Um, run through, so you can transfer money through the mobile phone system, through Safaricom. It works very well. You pay a transaction fee. It's a low fee. It's much, much better than what existed before in terms of um, ability to transfer funds within the country, particularly from big cities back to, to villages. Nobody, I think this is th th a couple of important points from this experience. First of all, nobody understood or anticipated how big the demand would be for this kind of money transfer at low cost. Very big pent up demand to bypass the banks and, bypass, and, and, and not have to carry cash on, on the minibus going back home, or find some, somebody to carry the cash for you. All the other ways of transferring money, very problematic. Second thing is, it was made possible by a, an unusually, but you might say surprisingly favorable regulatory system. Actually, the central bank said, go ahead and experiment. We'll see what happens. Central banks generally don't do this. Central banks in other parts of East Africa have not done this. M-Pesa is both very successful in Kenya and I think Unfortunately, not yet taken up enough in other, in other places, including uh, other parts of, of East Africa. It's a great opportunity. People trust the system, and you know, it's, this is not a cryptocurrency. This is you're, putting, you're giving your money to the phone company. Your phone company is holding 100% reserves in commercial banks. They have the full amount on deposit, and they're transferring the funds to an agent in the village who's giving it to the people you want to transfer it to. This is not a cryptocurrency. But it does speak to the fact that people want to be able to make payments more cheaply at what they regard as lower risk. If the cryptocurrencies can do that, can deliver on that promise, there are many, many countries around the world that would benefit massively from this. There are many transactions, including transactions across borders, where we pay far too much in transaction fees. So that promise of cryptocurrencies, I think, is, is a very appealing promise. Whether they can deliver is another matter. And that delivery is going to depend on whether you can reach an accommodation, a political regulatory accommodation, within the countries in which you want to operate. That's how Safaricom did it. Sure, you can have a store of value. You can have um, transactions in anything you want. You can buy and sell old master's paintings. You, you can buy them for delivery on, uh, offshore on the tarmac of the Geneva airport. Like, it's all stored there for you. No problem at all. Can you create a money? Can you create something that will be used to transfer value, to make payments, to replace credit cards, to replace cash payments? Like, that's the bigger question the cryptocurrencies are pursuing, and, and that's where Bitcoin has, has got our attention. 
And I think that Bitcoin is demonstrating some very important aspects, some positive, some more problematic, and we'll discuss both today. But you have to take on the politics, and the people who want cryptocurrency to succeed have to engage with the political agenda. They have to explain why this makes sense. They have to reach an accommodation with government, which is going to be difficult because you're challenging the system and you're challenging the credit system around which modern governments are structured. And I don't think cryptocurrencies are going to be consistent with or build up banks as we know them today. I think they're a bypass. That's the motivation. That, that's the goal. And I have no problem with that goal. I think, I think, Joel, ultimately, what we're going to do is end up with some system that will reduce the transaction costs. That the official system, which is very oligarchic right now and, and, and very much um, embedded with, with, the, with, the, with the way government operates, is going to have to change. Look, this is a great pressure point, And that's to the benefit of everyone. Do we end up exactly with cryptocurrencies as currently envisaged? I'm not sure, like, like you. We'll, we'll, see where, we'll see where this goes. But this pressure and this fight is going to be political. It's going to be technical. It's going to be about the economics. Sure, it's going to be about the structure of the financial system. But mostly, it's going to be political. And that's why I'm looking forward so much to what we're going to discuss today. Thank you very much.